Chapter 19, To Kill a Mockingbird, by Harper Lee. Thomas Robinson reached around, ran his fingers under his left arm, and lifted it. He guided his arm to the Bible, and his rubber-like left hand sought contact with the black binding. As he raised his right hand, the useless one slipped off the Bible and hit the clerk's table. He was trying again when Judge Taylor growled, That'll do, Tom. Tom took the oath and stepped into the witness chair. Atticus very quickly induced him to tell us. Tom was 25 years of age. He was married with three children. He'd been in trouble with the law before. He once received 30 days for disorderly conduct. It must have been disorderly, said Atticus. What did it consist of? Got in a fight with another man. He tried to cut me. Did he succeed? Yes, sir. A little. Not enough to hurt. You see, I... Tom moved his left shoulder. Yes, said Atticus. You were both convicted? Yes, sir. I had to serve because I couldn't pay the fine. Other fellow paid his'n. Dill leaned across me and asked Jem what Atticus was doing. Jem said Atticus was showing the jury, jury that Tom had nothing to hide. Were you acquainted with Myla Violet Yule? asked Atticus. Yes, sir. I passed her place going to and from the field every day. Whose field? I picks for Mr. Link D's. Were you picking cotton in November? No, sir. I works in his yard fall and winter time. I works pretty steady for him all year round. He's got lots of pecan trees and things. You say you had to pass the Yule place to get to and from work. Is there any other way to go? No, sir. None's I know of. Tom, did she ever speak to you? Why, yes, sir. I'd tip my hat when I'd go by, and one day she asked me to come inside the fence and bust up a shiffer robe for her. When did she ask you to chop up the, the shiffer robe? Mr. Finch, it was way last spring. I remember it because it was chopping time and I had my hoe with me. I said I didn't have nothing but this hoe, and she said she had a hatchet. She gave me the hatchet and I broke up the shiffer robe. She said, I reckon I'll have to give you a nickel, won't I? And I said, no ma'am, there ain't no charge. Then I went home. Mr. Finch, that was way last spring, way over a year ago. Did you ever go on the place again? Yes, sir. When? Well, I went lots of times. Judge Taylor instinctively reached for his gavel but let his hand fall. The murmur below us died without his help. Under what circumstances? Please, sir? Why did you go inside the fence lots of times? Tom Robinson's forehead relaxed. She'd call me in, sir. Seemed like every time I passed by yonder, she'd have some little something for me to do. Chopping kindling, toting water for her. She watered them red flowers every day. Were you paid for your services? No, sir. Not after she offered me a nickel the first time. I was glad to do it. Mr. Yule didn't seem to help her none, and neither did the chillin'. I know she uh, didn't have no nickels to spare. Where were the other children? She, uh, they was always around, all over the place. They watched me work, some of them, uh, some of them sat in the window. Would Miss Myella talk to you? Yes, sir, she talked to me. As Tom Robinson gave his testimony, it came to me that Myella Yule must have been the loneliest person in the world. She was even lonelier than Boo Radley, who had not been out of the house in 25 years. When Atticus asked her, asked, had she any friends, she seemed not to know what he meant, and she thought he was making fun of her. She was as sad, I thought, as what Jem called a mixed child. White people wouldn't have anything to do with her because she lived among pigs. Negroes wouldn't have anything to do with her because she was white. She couldn't live like Mr. Dolphus Raymond, who preferred the company of Negroes, because she didn't own a river bank and she wasn't from a fine old family. Nobody said, that's just their way, about the Ewells. Maycomb gave them Christmas baskets, welfare money, and the back of its hand. Tom Robinson was probably the only person who had ever, who was ever decent to her. But she said he took advantage of her, and when she stood up and looked at him as if he, and then she stood up and looked at him as if he were dirt beneath her feet. Did you ever, Atticus interrupted my meditations, at any time go on the Yule property did you ever set foot on the Yule property without an express invitation from one of them? 
No, sir, Mr. Finch, I never did. I wouldn't do that, sir. Atticus sometimes said that one way to tell whether a witness was lying or telling the truth was to listen rather than watch. I applied this test. Tom denied it three times in one breath, but quietly with no hint of whining in his voice, and I found myself believing him in spite of his protesting too much. He seemed to be a respectable Negro, and a respectable Negro would never go into somebody's yard uh, of his own volition. Tom, what happened to you on the evening of November 21st of last year? Below us, the spectators drew a collective breath and leaned forward. Behind us, the Negroes did the same. Tom was a black velvet Negro, not shiny, but soft black velvet. The whites of his eyes shone in his face, and when he spoke, we saw the flashes of his teeth. If he had been whole, he would have been a fine specimen of a man. Mr. Finch, he said, I was going home as usual that evening, and when I passed the Yule place, Miss Myella were on the porch, like she said she were. It seemed real quiet-like, and I didn't quite know why. I was studying why, just passing by, when she says for me to come there and help her a minute. Well, I went inside the fence and looked around for some kindling to work on, but I didn't see none, and she says, No, I got something for you to do in the house. Then the door... Uh, the door's off, it tinges, and fall and falls coming on pretty fast. I said, you got a screwdriver, Miss Myella? And she said, she show had. Well, I went up the steps, and she motioned me to come inside, and I went in the front room and looked at the door. I said, Miss Myella, this door look all right. I pulled it back and forth, and the hinges was all right. Then she shut the door in my face. Mr. Finch, I was wondering why it was so quiet-like, and it came to me that there wasn't a child on the place. Not a one of them, and I said, Miss Myella, where the chillin'? Tom's velvet skin had begun to shine, and he ran his hand over his face. I said, where's the chillin'? He continued, and she says, she was laughing, sort of. She says, they're all gone to town to get ice creams. She says, took me a slap year to save seven mickles, but I done it. They're all gone to town. Tom's discomfort was not from the humidity. What did you say then, Tom? asked Atticus. I said something like, Uh, why, Miss Myella, that's right smart of you to treat him. And she said, You think so? I don't think she understood what I was thinking. I meant it was smart of her to save like that, and nice of her to treat him. I understand you, Tom. Go on, said Atticus. Well, I said I'd best be going. I couldn't do nothing for her and she says oh yes I could and I ask her what and she says to just step on that yon that chair yonder and get that box down from on top of the shift robe not the same shift robe you busted up asked Atticus the witness smiled no sir another one was as tall as the room so I done what she told me and I was just reaching when the next thing I know she 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 grabbed me around the legs grabbed me around the legs Mr. Finch she scared me so bad I hopped down and turned the chair over. That was the only thing. Only furniture disturbed in the room, Mr. Finch, when I left it, I swear before God. What happened after you turned the chair over? Tom Robinson had come to a dead stop. He glanced at Atticus, then at the jury, then at Mr. Underwood, sitting across the room. Tom, you're sworn to tell the whole truth. Will you tell it? Tom ran his hand nervously over his mouth. What happened after that? Answer the question, said Judge Taylor. One third of his cigar had vanished. Mr. Finch, I got down off of the chair and turned around, and she sort of jumped on me. Jumped on you violently? No, sir. She hugged me. She hugged me around the waist. This time, Judge Taylor gavel, Judge Taylor's gavel came down with a bang, and as it did, the overhead lights went on in the courtroom. Darkness had not yet come, but the afternoon sun had left the windows, Judge Taylor quickly restored order. Then what did she do? The witness swallowed hard. She reached up and kissed me on the side of the face. She said she never kissed a grown man before, and she might as well kiss an N. She says uh, what, her papa, what her papa do to her don't count. She says, kiss me back, N. I say, Miss Maudie, or excuse me, I say, Miss Maella, let me out of here and tried to run but she got her, her back to the door and I had to push her I didn't want I want I didn't want to harm her Mr. Finch and I say let me pass but just when I say it Mr. M Mr. Yule yonder hollered through the window 
What did he say? Tom Robinson swallowed again, his eyes widened. Something not fitting to say, not fitting for these folks and chillin' to hear. What did he say, Tom? You must tell the jury what he said. Tom Robinson shut his eyes tight. He says, you goddamn whore, I'll kill you. Then what happened? Mr. Finch, I was running so fast I didn't know what happened. Tom, did you rape Myla Yule? I did not, sir. Did you harm her in any way? I did not, sir. Did you resist her advances? Mr. Finch, I tried. I tried without being ugly to her. I didn't want to be ugly. I didn't want to push her or nothing. It occurred to me that in their own way, Tom Robinson's manners were as good as Atticus's. Until my father explained it to me later, I did not understand the subtlety of Tom's predicament. He could not have dared strike a white woman under any circumstances and expect to live long, so he took the first opportunity to run, a sure sign of guilt. Tom, go back once more to Mr. Yule. Did he say anything to you? Not anything, sir. He might have said something, but I weren't there. That'll do, Atticus cut in sharply. What did you hear? Uh, who was he talking to? Mr. Finch. He were talking and looking at Miss Myella. Then you ran. I sure did, sir. Why did you run? I was scared, sir. Why were you scared? Mr. Finch, if you was an N like me, you'd be scared too. Atticus sat down. Mr. Gilmer was making his way to the witness stand. Just before he got there, Mr. Link Dees rose from the audience and announced, I just want the whole lot of you to know one thing right now. That boy's worked for me eight years, and I had a speck of trouble out of him. Not a speck. Shut your mouth, sir! Judge Taylor was wide awake and roaring. He was also pink in the face. His speech was miraculously unimpaired by his cigar. Link D's, he yelled. If you have anything you want to say, you can say it under oath and at the proper time, but until then, you get out of this room, you hear me, get out of this room, sir, you hear me, I'll be damned if I'll listen to this case again. Judge Taylor looked daggers at Atticus as if daring him to speak, but Atticus had ducked his head and was laughing into his lap. I remembered something he had said about Judge Taylor's ex-cathedra, ex-cathedra, Remarks sometimes exceeding his duty, but that few lawyers ever did anything about them. I looked at Jem, but Jem shook his head. It ain't like one of the jurymen got up and started talking, he said. I think it'd be different then. Mr. Link was just disturbing the peace or something. Judge Taylor told the reporter to expunge anything he'd happened to have written down after Mr. Finch. Uh, if you were an N like me, you'd be scared too, and told the jury to disregard the interruption. He looked suspiciously down the aisle and waited, I suppose, for Mr. Link D's to effect total departure. Then he said, go ahead, Mr. Gilmer. You were given 30 days once for disorderly conduct, Robinson, said Mr. Gilmer. Yes, sir. What'd the N look like when you got through with him? He beat me, Mr. Gilmer. Yes, but you were convicted, weren't you? Atticus raised his head. It was a misdemeanor, and it's in the record, Judge. I thought he sounded tired. Witness will answer, though, said Judge Taylor, just as wearily. Yes, sir, I got 30 days. I knew that Mr. Gilmer would sincerely tell the jury that anyone who was convicted of disorderly conduct could easily have had it in their heart to take advantage of Miley Yule. That was the only reason he cared. Reasons like that helped. Robinson, you're pretty good at bussing up shifferobes and kindling with one hand, aren't you? Yes, sir, I reckon so. Strong enough to choke the breath out of a woman and sling her to the floor. I never done that, sir. But you're strong enough to. I, re I reckon so, sir. Had your eye on her a long time, hadn't you, boy? No, sir, I never looked at her. Then you were mighty polite to do all that chopping and hauling for her, weren't you, boy? I was just trying to help her out, sir. That was mighty generous of you. You had chores at home after your regular work, didn't you? Yes, sir. Why didn't you do them instead of Miss Yule's? I done them both, sir. You must have been pretty busy. Why? Why what, sir? Why were you so anxious to do that woman's chores? 
Tom Robinson hesitated, searching for an answer. Looked like she didn't have anybody to help her, like I says. With Mr. Yule and seven children on the place, boy? Well, I says, it looked like they never help her none. You did all that chopping and work out of from sure goodness, boy? Tries to help her, I says. Mr. Gilmer smiled grimly at the jury. You're a mighty good fellow, it seems. Did all that for not one penny. Yes, sir. I felt right sorry for her. She seemed to try more than the rest of them. You felt sorry for her? You felt sorry for her? Mr. Gilmer seemed ready to rise to the ceiling. The witness realized his mistake and shifted uncomfortably in the chair, but the damage was done. Below us, nobody liked Tom Robinson's answer. Mr. Gilmer paused a long time to let it sink in. Now you went by the house as usual last November 21st, he said, and she asked you to come in and bust up a shiffer robe. No, sir. Do you deny that you went by the house? No, no, sir. She said she had something for me to do inside the house. She says she asked you to bust up a shift robe. Is that right? No, sir, it ain't. Then you say she's lying, boy. Atticus was on his feet, but Tom Robinson didn't need him. I don't say she's lying, Mr. Gilmer. I say she's mistaken in her mind. To the next ten questions, Mr. as Mr. Gilmer reviewed Myella's version of events, the witness's steady answer was that she was mistaken in her mind. Did Mr. Yule run you off the place, boy? No, sir, I don't think he did. Don't think? What do you mean? I mean, I didn't stay long enough for him to run me off. You're very candid about this. Why did you run so fast? I says I was scared, sir. If you had a clear conscience, why were you scared? Like I says before, it weren't safe for any end to be in a, a fix like that. But you weren't in a fix. You testified that you were resisting Miss Yule. You were so scared that she'd hurt you. You ran. A big buck like you. No, sir, I was scared I'd be in court, just like I am now. Scared of arrest. Scared you'd have to face up to what you did. No, sir. Scared I'd have to face up to what I didn't do. Are you being impudent to me, boy? No, sir. I didn't go to be. This was as much as I heard of Mr. Gilmer's cross-examination, because Jem uh, made me take Dill out. For some reason, Dill had started crying and couldn't stop quietly at first. Then his sobs were heard by several people in the balcony. Jem said if I didn't go with him he'd make me and reverend sykes said i'd better go so i went dill had seemed to be all right that day nothing wrong with him but i guess he hadn't fully recovered from running away ain't you feeling good i asked when we reached the bottom of the stairs dill tried to pull himself together as we ran down the south steps mr link dees was a lonely figure at the top step anything happened in scout he went uh he asked as we went by no sir i answered over my shoulder dill here he's sick Come on out yonder, uh, under the trees, I said. Heat got you, I expect. We chose the fattest live oak, and we sat under it. It was just him I couldn't stand, Dill said. Who, Tom? That old Mr. Gilmer doing him that way, talking so hateful to him. Dill, that's his job. Why, if, he didn't, if we didn't have prosecutors, well, we wouldn't have defense attorneys, I reckon. Dill exhaled patiently. I know all that, Scout. It was the way he said it that made me sick, just plain sick. He's supposed to act that way, Dill. He was cross. He didn't act that way when, Dill, those were his own witnesses. Well, Mr. Finch didn't act that way to Myella and old man Yule when he cross-examined them. The way that man called him boy all the time and sneered at him and looked around at the jury every time he answered. Well, Dill, after all, he's just a Negro. I don't care one speck. It ain't right. Somehow it ain't right to do them that way. Hasn't anybody got any business talking like that? It just makes me sick. That's just Mr. Gilmer's way, Dill. He does them all that way. You never seen him get good and down on one yet. Why, when, well, today Mr. Gilmer seemed to me like he wasn't half trying. They do them all that way, most lawyers, I mean. Mr. Finch doesn't. He's not an example, Dill. He's... I was trying to grope in my memory for a sharp phrase of Miss Maudie Atkinson's. I had it. He's the same in the courtroom as he is on the public streets. That's not what I mean, said Dill. 
I know what you mean, boy, said a voice behind us. We thought it came from the tree trunk, but it belonged to Mr. Dolphus Raymond. He peered around the trunk at us. You aren't thin-hided. It just makes you sick, doesn't it?